Happy Mother's Day. Yeah. Good, good. Yeah. 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 Um, I wanted to be here especially, even though know, this isn't my usual day, to uh, support my friend and colleague, uh, Colleen. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, kind of sharing a talk with her today, although I, I want her to do most of the talking, probably. <laughs> Uh, I've asked her to help me um, develop the secular Dharma program, I'm calling it here, um, Lions Are. So uh, that means that uh, people can approach the meditation training from uh, a true beginner's mind. So we've already um, uh, been talking about it, but I want, and we've done a summary for called Entering the Path for people that want to commit to doing um, some of the insights and meditation that Buddha Dhamma has to offer, but uh, they don't necessarily have to commit to do anything. Uh, American style, do it yourself, right? So in line with that, uh, Colleen and I are going to um, host a workshop called Everyday Mindfulness. Um, sometime this year, now that things are um, opening up some more, and I hope they continue that way, so that and we should stay healthy. Um, that's an important workshop that will be open to everybody, um, and we'll be doing it for credit for the therapists and nurses out there. And also, um, the last, last weekend of July, July 30th and 31st, um, Venerable Tenzin Choki will be coming and talking on cultivating compassion and giving a workshop. And that's also what Colin will be talking about today, cultivating compassion, uh, the program that's been developed and that Colin go into detail. But uh, everyday mindfulness that Colin and I are doing and, and secular dharma and um, Tenzin Choki's talk are all part of what I see as this movement. I'm particularly interested in uh, keeping meditation and dharma in line with um, scientific fact. <laughs> I find that important. And uh, keeping things in line with, um, may I say, liberal democracy. Is that okay to still say that? And um, I'm particularly interested in um, making sure uh, at least my stay on the planet of um, you know, pro promoting uh, you know, female Dharma teachers. So already we have a you know, very strong uh, presence here um, uh, in that line or And um, you know, I sometimes people say, well, how come we don't have more you know, Dharma teachers come. I said, well, don't you come and listen to Susan? Haven't you come to listen to Patty? Haven't you come listen to Ellen? And please come and listen to Colleen, right? So if we're teaching Dharma correctly and we have the right motivation and we have the blessings of our community and uh, teachers and colleagues, then that makes somebody a teacher, right? One with other things like willingness to see receive feedback and humility too. In other words, somebody that the continual learner is is a real teacher. So uh, I'm delighted to have uh, you all here today, and um, we're we're still going to do some prayers, right? Or what I like to say, or narrative meditation, to um, increase our motivation. Don't 
Yatsen Choji Nukjune Pema Jungne She Sudra Kordu Kadro Mangpo Kor Peki Jesu Dakju Ki Chen Ji Lokju Shaksu So Guru Pama Siddhi Ho Teacher, Go Destroyer, Thus Gone, Fully and Perfectly Awakened Buddha, Endowed with Knowledge and Good Conduct, Gone to Bliss, Knower of the World, Helmsman of Ordinary Beings to Attain, Supreme One, Teacher of All Gods and Men, Buddha, Go Destroyer, Glorious Victorious One, Shakyamuni, To You I Pay Homage, Make Offerings, and Go for Refuge. Teacher, Go Destroyer, Thus Gone, Fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, born to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, bow destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, bow destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, Gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, bow destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. When you, chief of humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth, and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who were wise at that time, I prostrate, completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector, to you I prostrate, endowed with the supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you, who is free from dust, matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate, protector, endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, Field of ocean-like merits and good qualities, to the thus gone I prostrate. The purity, free from attachment, the virtue, releases from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning, to the dharma that brings peace I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path, well abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities, to the sangha also I prostrate. Homage to the supreme Buddha, homage to the dharma refuge, Homage to the great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage, to all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms, and all aspects, with supreme faith I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action, accumulate virtue and goodness, subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning in clouds, Look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing, and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence, stirred by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind, 
I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen, and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jewel mandala, together with other pure offerings and wealth, and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O oh, my masters, my yadams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please send forth waves of your blessings. Adam Guru Ratnam and Dalakam Nayati Yami. The Heart of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. Prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time, the Bhagavan was dwelling on massive vultures mountain on Rajagriya, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration in the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then, through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Shariputra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no eye element, and so on, and up to, and including, no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to, and including, no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Chaiputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly, completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment and reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequal, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth, since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared Tayata Gate Gate Par Gate Par Sampati Bodhisa.
Hata kate kate par kate par sangate bodhisattva. Chaiputra Bodhisattva Mahasattva should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. When the Bhagavan arose from that concentration, he commended the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Agra Pateshvara saying, Well said, well said, son of the village. It is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagas rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Shaivari Putra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and had a praise that spoken by the Bhagavan. Does that give us a Oh, it does give us that. Okay. Now, oh, oh nice. Don't want to be looking at myself. Maybe I walked over. Okay. Um, does anyone know how I share my screen from here? How did you remember when we practiced the way we did this? That was bad, and the way we did this, that was not. Yeah, uh, that's not one. Thank you, Dr. Remember to share that just to the comments here. It shows I have it never shows actually there. done this before. Yeah, this is, so, oh. This is, yeah, but it's missing here. It's there. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is kind of like what, why I like technical things. Yeah, Yeah, that's that's a lot of the name of this. Okay. I do have to go to show slideshow though, right? I think we got it. Thank you, helpers. Okay, so given that it's Mother's Day, I am speaking. Is this still working? The mic? I, there, is that better? I think I just need to get a little closer. Maybe. How's that? Still okay over here? No. Okay. Uh, so yes, I am speaking about motherhood today and self-compassion. Um, I'll, I'll be saying mother because it is Mother's Day, but I don't see why any of this wouldn't apply to fathers other than, you know, some societal expectations maybe. Um, and then Lama's going to help me kind of figure out how we can apply this to relationships in general because ultimately motherhood is a relationship, right? So hopefully a lot of it will apply even if it doesn't if what I'm saying doesn't apply exactly to you. 
Um, so I have kind of this tradition now of going into how I got roped into the talk and how I came up with the topic. Um, so I was supposed to speak a while ago and something came up and Patty said, oh, I've got somebody else that can do it. And I was like, yes. And she goes, okay, but then I have to move you to May 8th. I'm like, oh, that's way out there. That's great. And I go, oh, May 8th is Mother's Day. Okay. Well, I always said when my kids were little, what I really want for Mother's Day is a day to not be a mother. So my kids are off with their dad and I can be here. Um, and I said, okay, Patty, well, what should I talk about? And she said, you know, like, I feel all of us moms, we just feel like we're never doing good enough. I just, no matter what you do, it's not right. It's not good enough. And I thought, okay, I, I definitely feel that way. So I can share that experience. I can talk about that. Um, and then when I talked to Lama about that, and I said, I think I'm going to talk about the good enough mother. He said, don't talk about the good enough mother. That, that, that just feels shameful, right? Talk about, talk about self-compassion. There is something, right, that when we think about good enough mother, that it's really not good enough. Now, mom has known me for eight or so years now like at this point. Yeah. And one of the things that we share was we both have a little bit of ODD, so, um, which is additional uh, defiant disorder for those of you who don't know. So I am calling this AKA the good enough mother. So, Okay, so just a little bit about myself, Colleen Tweed Wong. Um, I am a, a licensed marriage and family therapist and um, some of the ways that I'm qualified to give this talk is I do have a couple of degrees in psychology with minor in human development. Um, I've done some certificates on perinatal mood disorders and um, mindful motherhood. And as far as experience, I have worked in um, research at UC Davis in maternal depression and then actually working as a clinician in perinatal and mental health. And then the one that people always want to know, of course, is yes, I am a mother. Um, so these are mine. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and yes, all four of them, I only birthed three of them. Um, but this, uh, the, the short one, in case you didn't know I'm 5'9", so the short one obviously did not come from me, but she legally joined our family earlier this year. So yes, all four of those are mine. And this oldest one here, show up. he's actually a nuclear machinist in the Navy. So somehow I did an okay enough job, I guess, that people trust him with nuclear power. So I guess I'm doing okay. And if that's not convincing enough, I do have this um, glowing um, endorsement from my daughter, the youngest one, Georgia. And she said, I think you did an okay job. So we're on the path right there. So the good enough mother um, is actually a psychological term developed by um, I think Donald Winnicott in his theory about um, moms and child development. And well, so my, our question is, it, it is a little bit more complicated than just, nah, you don't have to be perfect. But I did agree with Lama when he said, don't talk about that, that, sh that, that brings up shame. And it does. And that's because when we think about it, we don't think about what's good enough, we think, meh, it's probably not really that good, right? Um, we come up with things like, you know, hey, I made my kid a birthday cake, right? Like, uh, it's, it's good enough, right? We don't really think of it as being all that great. So um, I love these, these Pinterest fails. Um, but that's not really what it is. What the good enough mother means is that um, we don't have to do everything for our kids, right? When our babies are born, they need everything from us. They don't think of themselves as separate from us. And we do kind of have to respond to every cue and demand. Um, but over time, uh, let me go back. I'm not following my notes. Um, but what I do want to tell people is that good enough actually is good enough. Our kids don't need us to be perfect. And I'll get into a few reasons why in a little bit. Um, is there anything at this point where you'd like to share or something? 
Or do you want to just let me know when you do have some? I'll jump in. Okay. I mean, the good enough mother is actually um, uh, uh, it was nice the way Winnicott tried to bring about the fact that um, yes, Colin said uh, the child will bring forth if you hover in a helicopter away, you don't let the child to develop their own inner image, mm -hmm. um, their own felt sense of their own motherness and the mothers inside them. So mm -hmm. that's the weird part. If you do too much for people too, then they don't develop their own inner world. So if, if it's that balance where you, um, you allow the child to develop their inner world, with, with the support, but it's still there in a world. Something like that. Yeah. Okay, but I am sticking with the term of the good enough mother because the not perfect mother is still good enough. Um, I love this artist. I forget her first name. Her last name is Bone. Oh, I think it's on there. Jimena Bone. Um, she just has these great little uh, comics that I think most people can relate to and on some form or another. Um, so then I kind of go, well, what is good enough? What do kids actually need? Um, and I did actually like this part uh, by that if I would rather be the child of a mother who has all the inner conflicts of the human being than to be mothered by someone for whom, sorry, okay, good. A text just came in from my mom on my laptop, just making sure that I didn't show up there. Um, by someone for whom all is easy and smooth, who knows all the answers and is a stranger to doubt. So what do kids need? Um, when I became a parent, I decided that I was going to focus on two things in order to make all of my decisions, all the little decisions, things had to go through two questions, okay? So kids need love and they need guidance, right? So my goals for parenting were that my children would feel loved and know that they are deserving of love and to know how to make good decisions for themselves. Right? So there is actually, I didn't realize it at the time, even that, even though I was aware of this research, that this actually fits into the work of uh, Diana Ainsworth, who put parents into four categories, right? So we have these two um, concepts of warmth and control, and then parents could fall into each of these four categories. Um, so the first one that we have with the high warmth, low control is uh, the permissive parent. And this parent is indulgent, avoids conflict, few rules, non-directive, low expectations, lenient. Um, down in the bottom, oh, but also these parents tend to be uh, accepting, supportive, and respect autonomy and agency, which good things, right? Bottom left corner, we have low warmth and low control. So these are the uninvolved parents. Um, who often have competing priorities. Uh, it's they're neglectful. It's not always their fault. A lot of the times, these parents just don't have the resources to really even be around very much. Little time, but they may also be kind of uninterested, absent, or passive when they are involved. Um, on the bottom right. We have low warmth and high control, and we've got authoritarian parents. Uh, these are autocratic, high expectations, strict punishment, and power over. But the good thing about these parents is they have clear rules, they expect high performance, and they're very structured environments. And then the last one, and I, what I don't like about this is that these names are so similar, but um, authoritative parenting. So these are parents that are responsive, democratic, assertive, responsive, high expectations, um, reciprocal, flexible, and they have clear standards. So what to me really stands out from this is that this is a reciprocal relationship. This relationship goes both ways. Motherhood is a hierarchical 
equal relationship, right? We don't expect the kid to meet the needs of the mom, the mom meets the needs of the kid. But at some point, that should shift a little bit. Okay, so I, I, I changed these. So in my mind, it's love and guidance. I didn't use the terms of uh, warmth and control. And obviously, authoritative is where we're aiming at. People want me to keep going over this because I feel like people's eyes are glazing over and I'm tired of my own voice already, but I can, I can kind of go through real quick about um, what types of results we see in children from these um, perspectives. Okay, I like that it's kind of concrete. It gives us something to do because as moms, we feel like we're supposed to do everything and we're like, well, I don't even know where to start. So these are some things that give us some um, kind of concrete rules. So children of permissive parents tend to be spoiled, immature, self-centered, and have poor self-control. Uh, uninvolved parents, frequent addiction, poor social skills, socially withdrawn. Authoritarian parents tend to have low independence, low self-esteem, passive rigidity. And then um, the children of the authoritative parents are more self-reliant, self-controlled, and flexible. Okay. So that brings me to this concept of lazy parenting. Any questions so far? Questions, comments, stories? Nope, okay. So another thing that I kind of started doing as a mom without realizing this is actually a thing is what they call lazy parenting. And a lot of the articles that I found on this are really upset about the name, and I get that, but I feel like lazy parenting is kind of a good um, style that falls into what Winnicott was trying to say, which was it gives children space to learn things themselves, to have struggles, to be frustrated, to learn how to self-soothe, to learn how to take care of themselves and develop confidence and confidence in themselves. Okay, and this is kind of built on a theory from, um, or concept from child development called scaffolding. And this is kind of where I came up with my latest parenting is that scaffolding is the idea that you do the part for your child that they cannot do themselves. Um, so like when babies are first born, they can't soothe themselves, right? They don't know if they're hungry, they're tired, they don't know what they want. So you respond to every cue, you meet every need. As they get older, you start to let them struggle a little bit, just the amount that is appropriate for them, the amount that they can manage. Um, and then you do the part that they can't. So as the kid gets older and more mature and more capable, parents actually get less and less involved. This is kind of like what you were talking about. Yeah. So like, I always think of this, like, it, like to think of a kid like tying his shoes, right? A kid doesn't know how to tie his shoes, right? You don't put the shoe on for him, tie the shoelaces, there you go. You say, well, give him the part they can do. Okay, well, get your socks on. Okay, well, can you put the shoes on? Okay, well, can you make the loop? Okay, you can't do the knot part yourself, I'll do the knot part yourself. And over time, they learn. Okay, so obviously mothering is a very important job, right? I, I see a lot of the people, you know, that had maybe not good enough parenting. Um, so we want to take it seriously. But also it might be nice if we kind of got away from blaming moms for everything. Um, so what is the alternative? Oops, and that's where we come to self-compassion. So self-compassion is uh, basically made up of three parts, I think. So self-kindness. So this is just kind of being nice to yourself when you make mistakes, having some kind of compassion. Common humanity. And I think this one is so important for parents is that we are all struggling. Whether that mom looks like she's struggling or not, she is. Maybe not in the same degree, not maybe not in the same way. 
but everybody is. And then mindfulness. So this is actually kind of acknowledging, acknowledging that we're struggling, acknowledging that things are hard, saying to myself like this, this is difficult. It is hard rather than pushing it away or um, completely diving into this, it's like this just sucks. I mean, it's interesting. Anybody uh, familiar with the concept of wabi-sabi? And I may be butchering it because my Japanese is terrible. No? Really? No wabi-sabi? <laughs> it would be a good mustard, huh? Wasabi. Yeah. Uh, wabi-sabi is a Japanese concept of valuing the imperfection in something. So these are these like artisan vases like you see here. Um, and even what they'll do is they'll take something that is broken and they'll fix it with gold so that that, that imperfection becomes part of the beauty of it. Because really parenting's pretty funny and it's usually the things that go wrong that we remember, right? The things that are kind of messy. Like, this is fun. You know, we had a rule in our house. You can make a mess. You have to clean it up, but you can make a mess. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I just reminded that I'm gonna come on poem and song, the cracks are what oh. the light. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, this is something that I found um, on TikTok actually that was just kind of streaming through and I went, oh yeah, I relate to that. So maybe somebody else does too, but this woman was saying to be a good woman the reason that it's so hard is that the reason to be a good woman is to be good for other people. So to be a good mom to your children, to be a good daughter to your parents, to be a good wife to your husband, wife, to be a good sister to your siblings, a good friend to her friends. Problems with this, this places your worth entirely on the perceptions of others, what, how others perceive what you're doing. And these roles often conflict with each other. So great, I'm doing something and my mom thinks I'm great, but now my kid thinks I'm a punk or my siblings think I'm whatever. So it's impossible to keep everybody happy, even if you're doing a good job with all of these things. And then finally, what about her needs? Why don't women get to have needs too? And then finally, and this one I always come back to is, what does this model for our children? If I'm teaching my daughter that the way to be a good woman is to only take care of everybody else, what does tell, that tell her about her value? Um, is everybody familiar with Glennon Doyle? No? Okay. Sometimes I forget, like I'm so in, in, like emerged in the world of psychology that I forget who people like know and don't. Um, I really like her. She has a book out that came out just before uh, the pandemic called Untamed. That's a very easy, quick read. Um, she also has a podcast called We Can Do Hard Things. Um, but this is one of my favorite quotes by her. She says, we become responsible adults when we become disobedient daughters. When we finally realize that the best way to honor our parents is to trust fully owning the women that they have raised ourselves. Um, here's another one about mothers have martyred themselves in their children's names since the beginning of time. We have lived as if she who disappears the most loves the most. We have been conditioned to prove our love by slowly ceasing to exist. And this is one I definitely see in people, um, not just moms. So, I mean, kids don't even need a perfect mom. They need a happy mom. I see so many moms driving themselves crazy and making everybody miserable by trying to keep the perfect house, the perfect meals, be the perfect wife, the perfect daughter. They're driving themselves nuts, making themselves miserable, and not really being available for the kids. 
Um, this is a quote from uh, Ariana Huffington. And the fastest way to break the cycle of perfection and becoming a fearless mother is to give up the idea of doing it perfectly. Indeed, to embrace the uncertainty and imperfection. So again, that's something that we're modeling. When we say, I can be imperfect, it gives permission to everybody else, not just our kids, but our friends, our families. Say, hey, I'm not perfect. Um, it values authenticity, being real, rather than putting out the show, because anytime you see anything that's perfect, it's not real, right? It was not made by nature. If it's perfect, it's man-made, it's fake. Um, admitting our imperfections allows us to strengthen relationships through repair. If we're trying to be perfect, it's really hard to say, I'm sorry. It's really hard to acknowledge that we made a mistake and to come back and say, I want to do something different, right? It also means we're not modeling growth. If I'm perfect, where do I go from here? How am I growing? What am I working to do next? And even if you never say a cruel word to your child, if you have that voice going in your head that's constantly criticizing yourself and not offering any self-compassion, I promise your kids see that. And maybe they'll have a great childhood, but when they get to be an adult, they're going to think that's how they're supposed to be too. So, okay, obviously I'm back to Glenn and Doyle again. My children do not need me to save them. My children need to watch me save myself. So, um, obviously I'm a big Glenn and Doyle fan. There's also, uh, I just found out this morning that Brene Brown, if anyone's familiar with the gifts of imperfection, there's also the gift of the imperfect parent. I had not read it, but I just found out about this morning, but anyone who's interested, I do like Brene's work a lot. Okay, so I'm going to finish up with 10 ways to be a great and perfect mom. Take care of yourself. I know it's hard. I know you have no time. That's why you've got to let those other things be imperfect so that you can take care of yourself, even if it's just so that you have something in your cup to fill for other people, even if it's just so you're showing your, your kids how to to take care of themselves, you know? You're the mom who hasn't even showered today and you're trying to get your kid to get in the shower at the night. Like, you haven't even done it yourself, mom. Why should I? Okay. Uh, love and accept yourself. I know that's hard. That's even harder. It's so worth it. Realize that you're a mom for life, right? So a lot of this, we talk about babies, nurturing babies. You saw, my babies aren't babies anymore. I'm still a mom. I'm still trying to figure it out, right? It's impermanent. And that's one of the great things about uh, Wabi Sabi is that it really values impermanence and that things change over time. So even if you figure out how to be the perfect mom to three year olds, they're going to turn four and then they're going to turn five. And it's always changing. So don't get too attached. Create a life from yourself separate for your child, from your child. Again, especially when your kids are little, this is so hard. It can be done, even if it's just a little thing. I mean, I went back to school to get my master's when I realized every person who knew me knew me as someone's wife or mother. No one was like, oh, just this is just calling me. It's like, whoa, it's time for me to add something to my life. And so I went back to school. Uh, learn to apologize. Again, the importance of being able to recognize your imperfect means you can recognize when you made mistakes. Be open to your child's feedback. This is an interesting one. I like to ask my kids every now and then what I could do to be a better mom. It's never quite as helpful as I'm looking for. Like the last time it was like, we want you to play video games with us. I'm like, okay, did not go well, but it showed them that, you know, I was willing to try. I was willing to do things um, that it was, you know, a two directional relationship um, and that I could be, do things imperfectly and still have fun with them. And quality time with your children, which I think is probably what they were asking for more. This one I struggle with so much. Don't take your child's misbehavior personally. Let's be real. Kids can be shit sometimes, right? Right? They're not intending to be, they're people. They're trying to figure things out. It's not about you. And that's one of what the eight 
Something don't take don't take things personal. Is that one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. People say, you know, oh, I have kids. No, kids have you. Okay. They are not yours for you to make however you want them to be, right? It's not personal. They are their own people doing their own thing. Show your feelings, but don't overwhelm your child. I hear from adults all the time, my, my parents never fought, my mom never cried. What? No, of course they did. You didn't see it because your parents were trying to protect you. So it's okay for your kids to see you cry. It's okay for your kids to see you struggle. If you're completely overwhelmed, I don't know when I my divorce, there was some, you know, sobbing in the fetal position on the floor. I did that in the closet where they weren't going to see it, but they saw that I was upset. They knew that I was struggling. They knew that I was sad. And allow your child to be who they are, right? If we're not being ourselves, how are we showing them that they can be who they are? Okay. Feedback, questions, comments? Yeah. Oh, yeah, whoops. Okay. okay. I don't want to be looking at myself though. Can I switch streams? I'm not leaving. Okay. I did want to say something. I really enjoyed your talk very much. Um, but I'm stuck on the very beginning where it has the four boxes and where we as a parent get in. And now I'm a grandparent. And so I feel like there's a next next level of instruction. So maybe that um, how to, I guess, parent my adult kid and my grandkids. Mm -hmm. so, but I feel like I'm in the best place. Um, with Buddhism, I feel that, that that is the best gift that I can give to myself. What's your name? Susan. Hi. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny. Mom and I were talking about this what, a couple of weeks ago. Like, I took so many developmental psychology classes, none of them covered how to parent adult children. I'm looking for books. And every time I do a search, I get up with, I, I come up with stuff about like, how to care for your aging parents. I'm like, no, that, that's not what I'm talking about. Like they act like it stops at 18, right? It, it doesn't. For some of us, it gets harder in some ways, right? Um, I don't think the change, the needs change, right? I think they need less guidance. You need to wait and give them more space for when they ask for help, but they still need all the love and warmth, right? Um, I don't know, I, I can't wait to have grandkids because I plan to just spoil the crap out of them honestly um so yeah but then I'd, I haven't dealt with like any of the behavior problems yet either so yeah there is another level I think it just gets more complicated but I don't know that the rules necessarily change if that makes sense thank you yes Um, what would you tell a mother who discovers that um, she's been going along for most of her, her child's life as a permissive parent and thought she was doing the right mm -hmm. thing there, maybe as a, a response to authoritarian parents, right? Yep. Kind of going to the opposite end of the spectrum, but then realizes that they actually need that it'd be beneficial to their children to be a little bit more authoritative, but doesn't know how to, how to, develop that guidance or, or exert some control? Mm -hmm. Great question. And you're totally right, right? Like you see people who had the permissive parents and they become the totally authoritarian parents or vice versa. Um, one, you go back to you admit that you made mistakes. We're all doing the best that we can. I've never met a mom who knows what her kid needs and is choosing to give them something different, right? So you start small it's much easier to have boundaries and structure with kids and then light, lighten it up over time but like you said that doesn't always happen so then you have to come back in and say okay we're going to change the rules let's talk about how we're going to change the rules what do you think should happen um and me myself i'm not actually that big on the whole guidance part i tend to run more towards the permissive high in the warmth and a little bit with the guidance um, I believe in not natural consequences. 
as much as ads are appropriate, right? We don't let kids run into the street and go, oh, see, you got hit by a car. Um, and so part of it can be kind of like that, you know, like letting them in small allowable amounts start to experience some of the consequences of their behavior. Thank you. What was your name? Thanks for sharing, Daniel. Thank you, Colleen. <laughs> Um, I really appreciate this a lot, uh, especially because it is Mother's Day. Um, but as a community where we have mothers and fathers and kids, people in relationships, and you know, we've got little Buddhas starting up again, so we have kids around. Uh, as a community, how do we better support our mothers and our fathers and our kids so that you know, our mothers have the time and space to grow and have self-compassion and that our kids have a supportive environment when they are here and you know, we as a community become the caretakers. Um, and how, how do we actually do that? I, mean, I know this is probably a bigger, longer discussion, than, yeah. um, but you know, I think that to me that's a big value is having kids and having families and I think that's actually something that bringing these things into the community as a whole, especially, you know, I'll have kids. I'm not going to have kids. Right. So it's like that was about this, but that means that everyone is going to have kids. Uh -huh, that's right. I mean, the whole sangha here is my family. Um, and supporting my family is really important to me. Mm -hmm. And so I think that supporting our kids and our mothers um, in these things and in their challenges is, is important. And I, I don't quite know how to do that. Yeah. So, to community level ways. I've got a few little things, and I'd love to hear other people's input because it is a big issue, right? As as a very uh, individualized country, we tend to let moms do things all on their own, and that's really not how parenting is meant to be done. Um, one thing is that I tell most of my uh, perinatal clients is that. Baseball is not America's favorite pastime. America's favorite pastime is judging moms. We will judge them for any choice they make on any end. So I would say, you know, starting with some compassion, um, speaking up when you hear people being judgmental of other moms, looking for things that, you know, like I said, moms don't withhold things that they have to give. So maybe giving to the moms, um, Early in my career, I wanted to be a child therapist. I realized quickly, I do not want to do that. Um, I, I want to work with the parents because when you help the parents, then you get that trickle down. Um, that doesn't actually work in economy, sorry. Um, so yeah, any way you can support the parents. Asking, what can I do? How can I help? Can I take the kids for a minute? Having a relationship with a child. Again, we put it all on moms. Kids need more relationships than just their mom especially as they get older, right? Learning that there's other perspectives, other ways to do things. People who don't flip out when you spill the milk, who can say, oh, okay, let's get it cleaned up. Anybody else have any ideas? Great, if we could solve that right here. This is also going on uh, what Colleen said, but I just think asking, especially if you don't know, it's very simple. You know, Susan asked me one time, like, what, how can I support you, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And I was just, you know, we usually know what it is that we need for support, you know? If you need someone coming over for a visit, or I mean, that's the best way, really, is to say, how can we support you? And also, um, you know, this isn't Sangha related, but our country is notorious for not supporting uh, mothers in public policy. Even though, you know, parental leave, um, there's so a huge deficit in our country for supporting parents on a policy level. So vote <laughs> yeah. in favor of families. And it's funny that we even have to ask this question, right? Because in a lot of cultures, you know, parenting is a community thing. And we've lost that, you know, unless we have grandparents, like I do, that we rely on very heavily 
a lot of people don't have that, so just stepping up and asking makes a big difference. And while I have the mic, I just want to say, uh, since we are the only mother-daughter pair in here, this is my mother, and she probably did it as perfectly as possible. You know, she's she's very loving, she's incredible, and I'm so grateful that she's my mom, and so just wanted to say that. Yeah. Love you, Mom. Yeah. Um, I, I've had this dream which I shared with uh, Korean and others here about actually we could build a community where we support uh, moms and dads and families and do uh, intense yogic practice at the same time. Um, I really feel it's possible. Actually, we are doing it, um, and I want to continue to do it. Um, but uh, uh, that doesn't mean we're not um, uh, going to have imperfections. So uh, what Colleen's uh, talking about for me is, is the whole uh, bodhisattva path, the path of someone who's uh, heroic awake being who is willing to be in relationship with others and willing to bring them along. So if people take uh, a bodhisattva attitude, um, we're, we're taking on the attitude of being a parent, of being a mother for a set of needs, um, which is more than just being nice or, or more than just helping. So. How do you help develop people? How do you help bring them along? There's teaching involved in parenting, there's uh, disciplining, there's uh, rescuing, and there's having fun, and there's launching and continuing to launch. As um, I'm a parent of a, a 36 year old and a, almost a 40 year old. So um, <laughs> they're still asking for money. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still getting feedback. Yeah, but uh, I think we can continue to create an environment that's um, good for kids because um, really pretty much you can look on an ethical basis. If, it, if it's not good for kids, why are you doing it? It doesn't ultimately translate into but for children, then we're not going to have a culture going forward. We might become our hearts or enlightened or go to another planet or whatever fantasies we have, but um, we're, we're developing ourselves for the benefit of um, the next generation, aren't we? Even if they're not our physical children. Because a lot of people do have adopted kids and foster kids. And, but, bring people into the family, bring people into the tribe. So I, I hope I do more on, um, on parenting. You know, when someone does a really good talk like Colleen, I would think, oh, okay, there's got to be um, another talk on this. <laughs> because it, it's really, you know, so I, I'm really not, you know, we have great, intellectual program here, Buddha Dharma program, we do a lot of meditations. And I'm not really interested in people getting it right. I'm interested in the relationship they have with themselves and with material. The Buddha's enlightenment was interdependence, which is really relationships. There's no isolated thing. So I can't find isolated individuals. There's not somebody isolated in you. There's not a ghost in the machine. Um, we're independently interdependent. Um, it's just the inter independent piece because uh, in American Dharma, um, we, we have to have that sense of uh, initiative and we have to have the sense of that we have certain rights of our bodies and, and certain privileges, honestly. So when we're talking about uh, modern Dharma, secular Dharma, 
I, I really believe that we can have real relationships and compassion and independence with interdependence and relationship. What do you think? So uh, I look forward to ask. I, I feel this one more comment or question in the audience. Oh, OK. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, as a board member and also speaking on the 22nd this month, so I think I'm going to talk about uh, being a foster parent in yeah, Dharma. Oh, so we'll kind of bring parenting and just kind of yeah. um, talk about that. But what Colleen is talking about, what Lama's talked about, what we've all talked about is um, kindness and compassion at its most simplistic levels, right? And when we talk about lifetimes and preparations and planning in future generations, um, that includes expanding our temple to the entire block of B Street. And what would that look like in future generations? That would look like pretty much what a monastery looks like in Nepal or in Tibet or in South India today, where we have a K through 12 or K through 8 to start with for accreditation purposes, or even K through 6 for accreditation purposes, because it's very difficult to get accredited. But again, and the root purpose of that is to take into emotional hygiene that his holiness talks about that we're fundamentally missing in our curriculum within the United States today and how we can take not only at our local community level but also begin to create leaders right here within our own sangha through education, not only with traditional education but also the five sciences of dharma and the philosophy that we've all agreed to share and want to pass on for future generations. So, as a board member, I know that that's one of my dreams and we talked about in Darshan is being able to have a school where we can have monks come in five years old, right? And what that looks like. And then maybe even have dormitory on the next block, right? Where we are able to house 150 students or 300 students. And part of that is serving the community, taking in foster children, like some of Madoc, right? That's primarily what the monastery of Madoc does is they take in underprivileged children in the community that their parents basically drop them off at the monastery. They please take care and raise my child because we know you're going to be able to do a better job than we are. So to have those resources and services through Lions Roar, that's what we're talking about, right? That's the type of inspiration that we have. So thank you very much for your talk today. And uh, it's inspired my talk for the 20 seconds. So awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you. This, because I just needed this talk. So, <laughs> because this is really the whole. All I can just know that you know, it's really helped me actually. Well, thank you so much. So now, um, can I do anything else that you need to tell me for sure? Oh, <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, we're going to do our closing prayer. Um, due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chenrezig, Tenzin, Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of optimless compassion. Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Mars. Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. O Sangjakpa, I make requests at your holy feet.
So Colleen and I are gonna walk. We're gonna walk out the front door, um, but then come back in a few moments uh, after things get set up for for snacks. Those have been more than snacks. Last couple months have been like really. I don't know. Do you, Okay. Well, yeah, I'm not sure whether to really push, you know, lunch or snacks. But um, one one important uh, piece of that uh, you know, promoter does, uh, I would say, American Dharma is uh, for presenters to to stay around and have a meal and be available to meet personally. I mean, it's easy with Colleen, but um, many times um, you read books or lectures and you never really get to meet the people in classical um, you know Asian Dharma that are India that the teacher would would disappear right you don't we're not gonna we're not gonna hang out afterwards but but we need that we need to have um, just know what's going on in someone's daily life at the same time and, and build those kind of relationships and, um, I'm glad uh, we're all here, and hopefully, a few people can stay a little while longer and uh, hang out. Yeah. We need what about 15 minutes to set up? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, um, I'll. I'll probably be here till around uh, two o'clock today. So um, I'll be uh, asking uh, probably more of Colleen, and she's very good at, at saying no. What does this mean? <laughs> oh, she's saying yes. Um, but she's also really good at saying yes. So. Um, when lamas ask things uh, in Asia, uh, you're always supposed to say yes. Are you aware of that? And you you can never say you can never say no or be angry. But uh, here we here we have to learn the boundaries. Sometimes we do have to learn to say no. I can't do that. Or sometimes we do have to express uh, strong emotions. You know and. Uh, Sometimes I think, like Colleen, I'm too permissive, you know, like, because I take a lot of intensity. But uh, in America, we have to learn, sometimes we have to say no, right? And that's important. And sometimes we have to be able to express strong feelings, right? We can do that without becoming uh, disrespectful or violent, right? I'm not going to tell any jokes anyway. <laughs> So I, I hope people can, uh, I'll be here next Sunday also, and then Greg will be here after that. Thank you. All right, we're going to walk out. We should have some closing music, don't you?